just a little personal thing that happened. I uh, went to the barber shop the other day. There was a man sitting in the chair, and my barber was working with him, and he said, you look 10 years younger. And I said, do the same thing to me. <laughs> and then he cut my beard off and all. And then he said, you look 10 years younger. I said, yes. And then he said, you lost your senior discount. <laughs> As we near the end of February, we close out the shortest month of the year, Black History Month. We thank our historian, Carter G. Woodson, for his persistence and guidance for Black History Month. Remember, it started out as Black History Week. So do we say Black History Month is over? Now we can get back to normal. But my brothers and sisters, I don't know about you. I celebrate black history 365 days a year. I will say a bit more about our history, which is American and world history. We have often heard that we should love our enemies, do good to those who hate you, turn the other cheek, and give them your shirt and coat. How often have we heard these words of Jesus explained away? Oh, well, these are ways to make other people look bad. These are sneaky ways to get back at someone. Giving the shirt as well as the coat will expose the other person being ridiculed for being heartless. Turning the other cheek is to defy and embarrass a person. Doing good to those who hate you will cause them to be shamed in the eyes of the community. These are interesting ideas, but they don't really go with the last verse of the gospel. The measure you give will be the measure you get back. Jesus is not just talking about other people that they will get their just dessert. He is talking to his own people then and to us today about how to follow him. Even if this is not quite the level, living or dying by the sword, Shaming and being shamed still exercise a lot of power in society, especially in these days when we get a lot of tweets day and night, bullying and shaming. I just don't think Jesus would be recommending shaming others so they might in turn receive a shaming, like an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth or a death for a death. Dr. King stated, that if we use this eye for eye method, there'll be a lot of blind people in America. <laughs> but I want to tell you, church, the person who is blind is the one who can see but refuses to see. Paul's letter to the Galatians 6, chapter 6, 7 through 10, states, don't be misled. No one makes a fool out of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. So let us not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, there will be a harvest, a good crop, if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, everything we get, the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us, those in our family, the community of faith, and their church, and those outside of the walls of this church. So let us not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good to our families, neighbors, friends, enemies, the poor, the sick, the perpetrators of violence. All of God people, including the politician, needs God's love. As we wisely manage our resources before God under the principle of sowing and reaping, we need patience. That's because the harvest does not come immediately after seeds are sown. But church is easy to get, but dangerous to get fatigued. In the ancient world, the phrase translation means to lose heart. Get fatigued was used for the kind of fear and weariness a woman experienced during labor and before delivery. It describes a time when the work is hard and painful but also unfinished and unrewarded. It's easy to lose heart when we feel like that, 
But that is exactly what we must hang on and not grow weary while doing good. When Paul wrote, as we have the opportunity to do good, he clearly included himself in what he wrote. He spoke to himself because of the dangers brought to him by the politicians of his time. And the same is true today, church. Paul's work among them have not yet been ready, really been rewarded, so he needed to remember not to lose heart himself. When I looked at what Jesus commands us to do and have read this verse several times, I felt this message was for me, and this wasn't the first time I started with looking at myself. I knew I had some enemies. I just had to know who they were. I was able to list many of those who I recognize as my enemies. And my goodness, church, it was a long list. However, when I reflect on who was really my enemy, I looked in the mirror, and there it was. My number one enemy was me. I wondered how many times I put myself in harm's way with poor decisions and the need to get even to score. You hit or abuse me, so I will try to hurt you back. If I looked a little closer, there had been some negative gossip and harsh words coming from my mouth. With this insight, I began to understand our young men and women on the corners where life is not valued. How can they spread love, accept love, when they don't love and they don't know who to whom they belong to? We need to know ourselves, church, in order to share ourselves. I know why it's so hard for me to love my neighbor as myself. I had to love Jesus first, and with that love I could learn to love myself. Then, and only then, can I love and care for my enemies and all of God's family, because I will be seen through the eyes of God. I had to grow out of the desire to have so much overflowing in my life, closets cramped and no room left, clothes I may never wear again, the food I wasted while so many went to sleep with empty bellies, and while many I've seen with no coat, hat, or shoes. I know somebody out there know what I'm talking about. But right now I want to take a little right turn and speak a little about our ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. Our ancestors arrived on this continent 400 years ago in 1619 on the shores of Virginia. When they arrived, they brought their God with them. They brought a way of life that was inclusive of all of his people. The ancestors were strong and always gave their best. But despite their capture, the long walk to Gory Island and the door of no return, the Atlantic Passage, also called the African Holocaust, separation from family and friends, in many cases slaves until they died, or killed for trying to run away. And there was a white psychologist that gave a diagnosis to slaves who ran away, it was called tryptomania, and they were wondering why a slave would want to run away from where they were. They still don't get it, church. The Africans and African Americans have given America many gifts, their talents and work to make America. But the greatest gift is the gift of their African spirituality, not only to the Catholic Church, but to all religions. It was that kind of spirituality that made you know that God will make a way. There was that kind of spirituality that if you believe in God, you know that he has a way for you and that he has a plan for you. That's the kind of spirituality that was. However, we as a people are still waiting for our harvest today. We're still waiting for our seat at the tables of America. Langston Hughes wrote a poem, We Too America. I suggest to you that it's a must read. We must remember while the earth abides, there is seed time and harvest, cold and winter and so on. As African Americans, we're still waiting for the promise of our harvest in America. I remember his, the last sermon of Dr. Martin Luther King, and he said to us in the country, I have been 
to the mountaintop. And I have seen that promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want to tell you tonight that we as a people will see the promised land that harvest promised to us. Today, we still wait for that change that Sam Cook sung about. We are not to lose heart. We are still to do good whenever we get the chance. Remember that the harvest never comes immediately after planning. We have been waiting for a long time. But let's remember that America was not built in a day. Plants don't grow overnight. Children are not born overnight. Athletes don't become strong or proficient in a week. Wisdom isn't gained overnight, and so it goes throughout all of life. But grace and mercy follows us, and God is a promise keeper. I still wonder, when will there be a harvest for the world? Sung by the Osley brothers, if you remember. Where every person will be judged by their character, and their love of God, not by the color of their skin, their state in life, their medical and mental state. What a world that would be, church, riding on the free, free friendship train as the, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but during these times as African Americans, we continue to get the largest, the target of the society with no harvest in sight. The harvest continues to come to the larger group while we do not get the harvest because the larger group kept the harvest and shared it with their children, who in turn shared the harvest with their next generation. The harvest came, but we didn't reap any. African Americans continue to feel the pain that the large groups inflicts on us. The penal system, where 80% of the inmates are black, while we only make up 12% of the national population. Something is wrong here, church. We don't do all the crime, but we do most of the time. Our young boys are sentenced as adults, our men are called boys, and our women are called girls. While a 28-year-old white male is sentenced to 14 days for a crime he committed because he was just a kid. Throughout all the pain our ancestors and us today suffer, we will endure. We still believe in a just God and a loving God. Our ancestors knew a God that was always with them. They knew God was everywhere, even in this new land. In their religious practices, they saw and experienced God in all his creations, in the sun and the moon, the wind, rain, and trees, and plants, and most of all, their brothers and sisters. They brought their God with them to America. And I want to say thank you, ancestors. Uh -huh. At the heart of Jesus' teaching today are two teachings that are so important in our lives, forgiveness and acceptance of mistreatment. And Jesus tells us, love your enemy, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, and wait for the harvest to come. These teachings are so against our modern way of thinking. Yes, these same teachings would revolutionize our present world, if only if we all live them. The challenge is not to think to ourselves. Nobody should live that way. Whether we can be think thinking, how can I live this way because Jesus has invited me to live this way? I don't know about any of you, but my friends, that's a hard pill to swallow. For people who feel and are oppressed, and don't see an end to the daily berating and belittling many African Americans experience daily. Many of us who have been beat down so much, it's hard to keep forgiving. When we felt that we haven't been heard, we do make some noise. We are told to be quiet. Why do, and they asked us, why do you always bring up that race card? Things are so much better now for you people today. Tell the truth, church. These days don't feel so good to the people who are darker than blue and many other groups of people. But our ancestors did not give up. They had something so strong in them. And we have something so strong also. And you know, I love the people that look like me. 
Therefore, today forward, we need to say this out loud. I, we will not be silent when injustice is not addressed anywhere. We will, not. we will not be silent or feel ashamed when our people are marginalized and mistreated. We will pray for all victims of violence. We will pr continue to pray for our harvest, for all who have been waiting for justice, equality, and agape love. I'm going to paraphrase a couple paragraphs couple phrases from the gospel. Be merciful as the Father is merciful. In order to get mercy, we need to be merciful. Stop judging and you will not be judged. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give yourself. Gifts will be given to you. A good measure, packed together, shaken down, and overflowing will be poured into your lap. For the measure which you measure will in return be measured out to you. And that was one of Father Miller's first verses. And I often thought that when he said it, he was salivating because he must have been thinking about food coming down. <laughs> <laughs> but he just loved that verse. Let us pray to open our hearts that we might truly be open to forgiveness and acceptance of being treated badly. God didn't promise us an easy road, but he told us about the road to eternity. Let us love our enemies, the enemies of our country, the enemies within us, the enemies of our families, our personal enemies, the enemies of our church, and wherever the enemy may be. Let us love the outcast, the leper of, lepers of our time, who would we not want to live with on a regular basis. Let's bless, bless them and pray for them as well as ourselves. What a world we could create together if we walked this path with our Lord Jesus Christ. And the celebration of the Holy Mass today may give us strength that our ancestors brought with them. Let us remember the phrase from the gospel, for the measure which you measure will we in return be measured out to you. In all things, trust God, because there's something inside so strong. I know that I can make it, though you're doing me wrong. Something inside is so strong, young folks. You just got to stand up and walk with God.